اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ان انزلناه قرانا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون ان شاء الله تعالى in this uh, hour and 15 minutes or so we're going to have a session on the brilliance as it's entitled the brilliance of the book the way i'm going to conduct this session is not going to be a lecture uh, and I know you've heard that before, and then you still get a lecture. So I'll be trying to make, set some ground rules, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, anyone here ever attended a class with me? Anyone here? Okay, a good number of you. Those of you who haven't, good for you. Uh, what we're going to be doing, inshallah, is I'm going to try and present a topic to you as though you and like two other people are sitting here. Don't pretend you're sitting here with like 300 people. And I'm going to be repeating things. I'm going to ask you to repeat them with me. And in the middle of it all, I'm going to start asking questions to see if you remember what we just talked about. Okay? And then we're, we're going to build ideas one after, after the other to get to certain conclusions, inshallah ta'ala. Before we talk about the amazing features and the brilliance and the inimitable, uncomparable beauty of the Qur'an, we have to set some groundwork, some foundational work. So we have to talk about that first. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the three kinds of Arabic. If you're taking notes, take notes. If not, take mental notes. Three kinds of Arabic. Now, I'm going to oversimplify. This is not an academic lecture. So I'm trying to present this in a way that's easy to remember, easy to understand, inshallah. There are many more kinds of Arabic, but for this discussion, three kinds of Arabic. I'm not going to list them on the screen. I'll just tell you what they are. We'll call them spoken Arabic, number one. Spoken Arabic. Number two, proper Arabic. And number three, ancient Arabic. Who remembers? Don't look in your notes. Call it out, call it out, call it out. Spoken? Proper? Ancient, okay. Spoken Arabic is like, another word for it is busted Arabic, or slang, or twisted, demented, mutated, ugly. Also called Ammiya. Ammiya is dialectical Arabic, meaning Egyptians have their own, Algerians have their own, Moroccans have their own, the, the Lebanese have their own, the people from Khalij, from the Gulf states, they have their own. Everybody has their own, which Arabic? Spoken Arabic. They have their own spoken Arabic. Okay? They can be as far apart for those of you that happen to be Desi from, like, from Urdu to Punjabi. Okay, it could be that far apart. Or in English, it could be like English versus Guyanese. If any of you, if you know, if you've ever heard Guyanese, proper Guyanese, you can't really understand it if you just know English. Unless the Guyanese fellow decides to use English with you. Otherwise, you can't understand. Okay? So, though they are related, they're not the same. They're not the same. Now, that's spoken. What were the other two? Proper and ancient. In that order. Remember them in that order. Spoken. Proper and then ancient. The newspaper, the Arabic newspaper, the Arabic you know, uh, news television program, Al Jazeera or whatever, that is all in proper Arabic. That's all in proper Arabic. The, the, the Arabic term for that is Al Fusha. Al Fusha. Also, if you've taken Arabic in college, they call it modern standard Arabic. What they mean by that is Fusha, proper Arabic. Okay? That's proper language. It's correct Arabic. It's enunciated correctly. It uses the rules of grammar. Spoken Arabic, is it too concerned with grammar? No, but proper Arabic is. Proper Arabic is actually appropriate Arabic, correct Arabic. So when you're learning proper Arabic, when you're learning Fusha, you're learning correct Arabic. There's nothing wrong with it. But I did give you a third category. Ancient Arabic. We have to understand the difference. It's easy to understand the difference between spoken Arabic and proper Arabic. But the one you really have to understand, the one peop most people overlook, you know which, which difference it is? Between proper Arabic and ancient Arabic. Ancient Arabic is far more sophisticated, far more advanced, far more complex, far more intricate, far more involved, than proper modern standard Arabic. 
In other words, if you go to Egypt, all your friends are going to study Arabic, you say, I'm going to go study too. You go to Egypt, you come back speaking proper Arabic. That still doesn't mean you have an understanding of what? Ancient Arabic, they're two different things. And for the most part, the subtleties, the complexities, the minor issues in ancient Arabic, the things that Arabs would be able to hear and tell, oh, that's what's going on. That is no longer the case today. So even the average Arab doesn't hear what the Arab of 1400 years ago heard. They hear a different kind of Arabic. So what, the first thing we have to understand is why was proper Arabic even born? Why not just keep the Arabic of the ancient times? How come it changed? How come it went through a difference? So that's what we're briefly going to try to explain, okay? So far you're with me? Okay, so what's the mistake of the minister when he critiques the Qur'an? He judges the book based on proper Arabic, while it should be judged based on ancient Arabic. Actually, it is the standard of ancient Arabic. It is the standard itself. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about where this difference occurred. You have these Arabs, before the messenger came sallallahu alaihi wasallam. you have these Arabs. They just hang out in the desert. They don't have any buildings. They don't have much of a farming community. They, don't, they haven't even discovered oil yet. They're just kind of hanging out in the sand. Their neighbor is the Persian Empire. Another neighbor is which empire? Roman Empire. If you know anything about empires, they're always looking to increase the size of their backyard. You know that about empires, right? They're always looking to expand. But something interesting happens. Do they expand into the Arab territories? No, they're like, why should we send our soldiers out to get barbecued in the sand? What are we going to get out of this anyway? Leave these Arabs alone, they've got, they're useless. They have nothing we can take over. If they have monuments, buildings, cities, you know, natural resources, we should go after them. But they got nothing, so leave them alone. So the Arabs are by themselves. The Arabs are just hanging out by themselves. Now when you're by yourself, you're isolated, for the most part. I mean, there was some travel abroad, and there were some influences from outside cultures. For the most part, the Arabs enjoyed an isolation that no other nation enjoyed. And when you're isolated, your language becomes refined. Your language becomes more and more pure, because you're only talking among your own people. You're only talking among each other. The Arabs became so refined in their Arabic, you know, every nation has this thing called nationalism or patriotism. You take something in your country and say, we make the best cricket bats or whatever. You take something and this is your pride. This is what you have that nobody else has, right? This is the thing you have. There is even such a thing as state pride, right? You know, so every state has something that they, you know, we have the best whatever. Right? We have, we have the highest murder rate in the country or something. So something to take pride in. What did the Arabs take pride in? Did they take pride in the, the structures that they build? The armies that they have? What did they have that they could take pride in? That's it. That's all they had was language. So when you take pride in something, you really take care of it. It's a, it's a matter of national identity. So it became a matter of Arab identity to be focused, to excel to drop everything else and worry about this language. So much so that language was the highest thing to know. So much so that if there was a poetry competition between tribes, and you know there was a, in the, the ancient form of dissing competitions. Okay, so you have two poets and they're gonna diss each other's tribe, literally. The one who wins, the one who wins, has successfully humiliated the opponent tribe for generations to come. And the one who loses, chances are, has lost his head because of losing that competition. Because he didn't just lose a competition, he lost the pride of his tribe. He lost the dignity of his tribe. So they took poetry and literature very, very, very seriously. This was a very serious thing. I'll give you some things about why, how they took it so seriously. Or how they were pretty cool in the way they did poetry. It was some interesting things. I can't write, I'm not going to write Arabic on the screen because I don't expect everybody to read it. But I'll, I'll tell you a, a small example of a poet. They spoke in riddles. They spoke in images. And that's the other thing I want to mention to you. What did they see when they woke up, when they looked outside? What did they see? Desert. Nothing. When you see nothing, you develop a very vivid imagination. When you see, you know, our kids have no imagination. Allah.
They have no imagination. You know why? Because they watch stuff all the time. So when you tell them to imagine something, they imagine something they've already seen. But a good imagination is the one which can imagine things that it hasn't seen. And this was the Arab imagination. So their words were very imaginative. If you've heard a good khutbah, or if you've heard a tafsir class, or if you've heard a hadith class, and the, the, the speaker, the scholar, stops at one word and draws an entire picture inside that word. Why? Because the Arabs used very picturesque words. Their words were full of imagery. So I'll give you this poem. This poet, he started making poetry about how generous he is. How much he gives in charity. And his wife complained to him, she said, we don't have food to eat, what are you talking about? We're bankrupt, and you're making poetry about how charitable you are? And he turns to her and he responds to her in poetry, فَسَيْلُ حَرْبٌ عَلَى مَكَانٍ عَالِي And I'll tell you what that means in simple English. It means heavy rain doesn't get along with a house on top of a hill. I'll say that again. Heavy rain doesn't get along with what? A house on top of a hill. Now, what does that have to do with being charitable or being poor? What's he talking about? But you know what he was talking about? Now imagine, in your head, imagine a hill, and then imagine what on top of it? A house, and what's going on? Heavy rain. Where, does the water stay up there, or does the water come to the bottom of the hill? He says, but his provision comes from the sky. And there are two kinds of people in the world. There are lowly people, and there are high people. People that are closer to God, and people that are worldly. If your house is above, aren't you closer to the sky? Right? So the water doesn't stay with me, meaning the provision doesn't stay with me, I keep giving it. And who does it stay with? Where does it create a puddle? So the people that are rich are actually lowly. <laughs> and I'm high. And he says all of this by saying just what? A high house doesn't get along with heavy rain. So they spoke in these riddles. They, they wanted you to imagine what they're trying to get at. They wouldn't just say it. And if you didn't get it, they'd say, ha, ajam, non-Arab, <laughs> foreigner, you know. So this was a sensitivity to language that they enjoyed. Anyhow, the Qur'an comes to these people upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this environment, where they take a word and they rip it apart. When you say something that is open to criticism, they will criticize it to the nth degree. They will shred it to pieces. They were extremely critical. I mean, if you think movie critics today are critical, they were nothing compared to the, poet, the, the poetic critics of the Arabs. They would critique words. They would try to outdo each other. Of course, the best way to beat a poet is to do what? Not to attack his personality, but to attack his what? His poetry. Attack his poetry and now you've got something. The Qur'an is revealed and you know what? What are some of the things that the disbelievers said about the Qur'an. What did they say? Do you... Huh? One allegation was it's the word of a poet. Another allegation? Magic. What else? Fortune teller. Fortune teller. It's plagiarized from the Bible. Right? It's taken from another source. All of these, none of these say, except in one place in the Qur'an we find, if we wanted, we would have come up with something like this. We could say something like this too. Did they say it? No. They just say, ah, we could do it. And then they called it poetry. They called it poetry. And their own, their own poets when they went to challenge the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came back swearing, Wallahi, this is not what? It's not poetry. Then they said he's a mind reader. Now if he's a... See the thing is, when you have contradictory allegations, like if you're a, if you're a gahin, by the way, the mind readers in, back in the ancient times, they spoke mumbo jumbo. They spoke these weird words that nobody understands. And they would say, this guy is casting a spell. You know, you know that's what he's doing. But did these words make sense? The words that the messenger was saying? Did they make sense? They were thought-provoking words. So they were clearly not words of a mind read. Understand, when they say kahin, they don't mean <coughs> like our times, some kind of psychic abilities. They mean words that people that they knew that spoke this gibberish, and they were supposed to have some magical effect. 
But the one you have to acknowledge, it's oft repeated in the Quran, is the allegation that he that these are words of insanity, that he's possessed, and that he is in, that that these are magical words. First of all, when you say this is magic, you've already accepted that this is not normal. This is paranormal, right? By them accepting that the Quran is magical, or even alleging that the Quran is magical, they accepted its power. They accepted its power. It's an acceptance of its power. And to say that he is insane means they couldn't come up with saying they couldn't come up with any allegation against the Quran. So if you can't defeat the Quran, might as well accuse who? The Messenger. Messenger you know, when you lose a debate of ideas, then you start attacking personalities. Right? That's, it's very common. When there's a debate on issues, you can't beat them on the issues, might as well beat them on what? It's called character assassination. Right? So this is what they tried. But in and of itself, the Qur'an, they actually, even in their criticisms, they acknowledged its victory. They acknowledged its victory. Now the pro quick problem, I want to go very, very quickly, inshallah, because we're losing time. Islam came, Allah gave it victory, it became a power. Did it remain in the Arab world? No. Islam spread. Did Islam remain, did, did, did it continue to spread only among the Arabs or did it also start incorporating non-Arabs? Non-Arabs. To the point where a, a point came where the vast majority of the Ummah happened to be Arabs or non-Arabs. Non-Arabs. Non-Arabs became the majority. Arabs became the minority. Which means all the non-Arabs were now basically one o Arabic 101 students. Right? They were good at Persian or Roman or whatever else, but now they were becoming students of Arabic. When you have the average taken of the level of Arabic of the Ummah, has the average level gone down? When the Ummah becomes international? Yeah, it goes down. Also, the Arabs are now interacting with an entire global civilization. The, the Muslim Arabs, they're traveling all over the place. When you travel, does your language deteriorate? Sure. My Urdu was awesome. Until I had kids. No, just speaking. I talked to them in Urdu. They said, Dad, you're talking Urdu again. So, your language deteriorates over time because of influence from other languages. So, the only part of your language you keep is the most essential parts to get the point across. The deeper things, the higher things in literature, they start withering away. The Arab scholars, the Muslim scholars realize this. They realize that Arabic as a, as a phenomenon what, it, what existed in the, in the isolated desert is now changing. And this is a serious problem. Why do you think this is a serious problem? What do you think? Quran. Quran. In one word, the Quran. Why? Because if we don't appreciate the amazing Arabic of the desert, then we won't appreciate the amazing Arabic of what? Of the Quran our appreciation of the Qur'an is going to deteriorate. So we have to take measures to preserve the ancient Arabic. This starts happening even in the first century. You have lexicons, dictionaries of Arabic, collections of poetry written by Arabs, saying, قَالَ Arabu, The Arabs said. Why are they saying the Arabs said? That this word means this, this, and this. They're Arabs too. What they mean is the desert Arabs, the ancient Arabs, the original Arabs, the Arabs in whose tongue, in whose expression the Qur'an came. They said this. That's how they understood it. It may have changed a hundred years from then. And we're not talking a hundred years later now. We're talking a millennium and a half. So the language changed quite a bit. When we study the Arabic of the Qur'an, we're not studying proper Arabic. What are we studying? Ancient Arabic. Do you understand how we got from ancient to proper? Right? Globalization. The expansion of the Ummah. That's how we got there. But the study of ancient Arabic remains critical. It remains critical. The problem of our times in appreciating the Qur'an. Most people, what, what they know about the Qur'an, is it in Arabic or in translation? Most people, what they know about the Qur'an is in translation. It's in translation. And most people that know the Arabic of the Qur'an from, in Arabic know it in proper Arabic or ancient Arabic. They know it in proper Arabic. They are themselves not students of ancient Arabic. So even their understanding, <coughs> except the scholars, except those who dedicate themselves to that study, 
except them, is reduced. They have very limited appreciation of what the Qur'an is actually saying. It's very, very powerful stuff. And it's been reduced to very, it's, it's, we got a very shallow version of this incredibly sophisticated text. So this was the foundation. This was the first thing I wanted to share with you, the problem, the problem itself. But also, it has been held widely that you can only appreciate the beauty, the amazing perfection of the Qur'an in what language? In Arabic. But you know Allah Azza wa Jal revealed this Qur'an as a miracle, not just a miracle for one group of people. This is a miracle for who? Humanity, everybody. Everybody. So even though we will never taste the Qur'an like the Arab at the time of the Messenger we're never going to be able to get there, because we can't reverse time. We can still make attempts to display the beauty of the Qur'an in every language, including English. We have to at least try. We have to try. Because it is a right of the people to know how beautiful this book is. We can't just say, oh it's so awesome in Arabic, I can't even tell you in English, forget it. You can't do that. That's not fair. <laughs> you know, and this is, by the way, this is something you hear in khutbah all the time. Oh, this word in Arabi is so beautiful, English, eh. <laughs> And you're like, what, what? <laughs> tell me something at least. So the Qur'an, is it's, it's, it has this perfected eloquence to the point where you have spoken Arabic, then what? Proper Arabic, then what? Ancient Arabic, which one is the most sophisticated? And then you have Quranic Arabic. That's number four. Spoken Arabic, proper Arabic, ancient Arabic, and then a category in and of itself. Quranic Arabic like nothing else. Like nothing else. There's no poetry like it, there's no other literature like it. There's no literature in any language like the Qur'an. Nothing. There is not a book, not a chapter, not a line. You can't compare it to anything else. You can't. And first we'll talk about this from a very simplistic point of view, then we'll take some examples, okay? The Qur'an is made up of how many surahs? 114 surahs. Now, what is the common translation of surah? What is surah translated into? Chapter. Right? Surah is translated into chapter. Now you tell me. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. Is chapter 4 based on chapters 1, 2, and 3? No, in every other book it is. In every other book you don't repeat in chapter 4 what you already discussed in what? Chapters 1, 2, and 3. 4 is based on the first 3. There's no repetition. There's some sort of logical sequence that you can decipher. The Qur'an, does it repeat itself across its quote-unquote chapters? So they're not really chapters. It's not really a chapter. What we call chapter is something else. This is something else. Storybook has chapters too. But what happens? The chronology moves forward. Also, the Qur'an, you can't even divide it, you can't even call it unit 1, unit 2, unit 3. You can't even do that. You know why? Because the Qur'an defies human logic. Are, are the Madani surahs or Meccan surahs first and then the Madani surahs? No, it's all mixed together. Are, is the shortest surah first and then the longest surah last? No. Or is the longest surah first and shortest surah last? No. It's not going by size order, it's not going by subject order, it's not going by chronological order. It has its own unique order, unlike what? Every other book. There's nothing like it. It is uncomparable, even in its structure. Now the problem with human beings is when they, have, they get used to a structure, chronological order, numerical order, size order, these are all orders, right? Subject order. When they find none of these, you know what the accu accusation is against the Qur'an? Yeah, there is no order. The accusation against the Qur'an is, hey, we didn't find chronological order, we didn't find subject order, we didn't find, you know, size order, so that must mean there is no order, it's chaos. French Orientalists, German Orientalists, read their literary criticisms of the Qur'an, and you will find them saying the Qur'an has no structure. It's chaotic, ma'adullah. Now, just on a side note, I do want to mention, you're thinking to yourself, ah, who cares about these kufar? They're saying the Qur'an has no structure. We believe. 
Allah challenged them to look into the Qur'an. Allah challenged them, didn't He? And when they're critiquing the Qur'an, aren't they doing what Allah had asked them to do? They are. So when they are making criticisms of the Qur'an, they are actually fulfilling the destiny of the Qur'an. And we are in a position, we are in an oblig ob obligatory position to respond, Jazakallah. We're in a position to respond. Our response isn't, ah, we believe, forget them. No, no, no. We, have, we believe with eyes open. We respond to criticisms. We have answers. When you have no answer, you say, go away, you're a disbeliever. But we're not a religion of no answers. We are in, in an intellectual civilization. We have answers. We have answers. So now, the first thing was about the structure of the Qur'an. The second thing is the word ayah. So there's surah, we said we can't really do anything with surah, we can't really call a chapter, it's a proprietary term, a unique term, its own file format, right? Not compatible with anything else. What's the other thing? Ayah. What's ayah translated as? Ayah is translated as verse. Now the word verse, think of it in English. Where does the word verse get used? Don't think of religion, don't think of Islam, think of the word verse in English. What is the thing that comes to mind when you hear a verse? Poetry, song, verses of a song, verses in lyrics, verses of poetry, right? If not song and poetry, where does verse come up in English discussion? The Bible. The second connotation of verse is biblical. So either you're thinking of poetry and song, or you're thinking of... The Bible. Now interestingly enough, the Qur'an is very adamant in letting us know وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ what? الشعر وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَعِر This is not the word of a poet. This is not poetry. We didn't teach him poetry at all. It, the last thing you should be thinking about when you hear Qur'an is what? Poetry. Any comparison to it. And the last thing you should be thinking is that this is plagiarized from where? The Bible. But the two things that come to mind when you hear verse, even subconsciously, maybe it doesn't come to your mind, but the average English speaker, does it come to their mind? Sure. And if we're doing da'wah, we have to be clear of, of what words we use, what connotations, what messages we send. So there's a problem. The word ayah is it's unique. Nothing else has ayat. Nothing else has ayat. Nothing else has surah. Allah has, the Quran has surah. And it has ayat, unique, unique forms. Can't even call them sentences. You know, can you think of an ayah that's just one word? That's just one word. Can you think of an ayah, anybody? Well, asr is two words. Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman, one word. I can think of three ayat that go together to make one sentence. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. Three ayat, but grammatically, one sentence. The previous was one ayah, which is one word. Now there are three, three ayat, but how many sentences? One sentence. And then there are entire passages of, of uh, inheritance law, or of giving loans, like the entire page in Baqarah. Right? On giving loans. Entire paragraph. But how many ayat? One ayat. You can't confine it to any literary form. Except one term. There's only one term you can use for the ayah. Ayah. There's nothing else. Nothing else fits. Nothing else can, can describe it. So Allah gave us this unique literature which is uncomparable to any other literature. In the little bit of time that we have left, I want to share with you what makes the Qur'an so incredible. We just talked about what makes the Qur'an unique, but not what makes it incredible. Okay, we didn't talk about what makes it incredible yet. Just want to share with you a handful of ayat. When you and I speak, and babies cry, when you and I speak, we organize our thoughts. I come to this speech, I say to myself, first I'm going to talk about this, then I'm going to talk about this. This one's alive. I bet you it was that child. Okay. 
laugh at me, do you? Okay, anyway, so very limited. When you and I speak, we organize our thoughts. But you and I are incapable, when we speak, of organizing our words based on what we're going to say later. We can't organize our words based on what we're going to say later. Let me give you an example. I'll write it on the screen so everybody can see. Okay, look at this example. Read the first line with me. Kafa billahi. Kafa billahi. Repeat after me. Shahidan. Baini wa bainakum. Kafa billahi. Baini wa bainakum. Shahidan. Do you notice a similarity? They're very similar words. The words kafa billah occur twice. Is the word shahidan used in both ayat? Is, are the words baini wa bainakum used in both ayat? They're two different ayat, two different places. Your homework is to find out where. But, notice, now the rough meaning, the rough meaning is Allah is enough as a witness between me and yourselves. I'll say that again. Allah is enough as a witness between me and yourselves. The second ayah says, Allah is enough between me and yourselves as a witness. Very similar. The first ayah once again says, Allah is enough as a witness. What's the Arabic word for witness? Shahidan. Between me and yourselves. Bayni wa baynakum. The second ayah says, Allah is enough between me and yourselves as a witness. So the difference is sequence. The difference is Allah said witness first, me and yourselves later. Then he said, me and yourselves first, and he said, witness later, right? The thing is, the Qur'an is hypersensitive, microscopically sensitive to context. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, words are synchronized, like beautiful architecture. Perfect. You can't move a brick from its place, or the perfection will be lost. The first ayah, Allah azza wa ends the ayah, إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ خَبِيرًا بَصِيرًا Allah, no doubt, he is, has full news, has always had full news and has been full view of his slaves. The ayah ends speaking about Allah. The ayah ends speaking about Allah. When the ayah ends speaking about Allah, the word for Allah, shahidan, used first. It came first. The next ayah ends, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ I'm skipping some words. But it speaks about people that are losers. One ayah ends, they, they begin similarly, but one of them ends speaking about Allah. The other one ends speaking about not Allah but people. When the ayah ends speaking about Allah, it begins with mentioning Allah's attribute as shaheed first. When Allah ends the ayah speaking about people, the ayah begins with mention of between me and yourselves. Between my, me and yourselves, isn't that people? People first. So what is about to be said in the future actually has an influence on how words are organized even before. We don't have that ability when we speak. We don't have that capability when we speak. Even when we write, we're not that sensitive. But the Qur'an was not revealed as a written word. It was revealed as what? A spoken word. It was revealed as a spoken word. Allah Azza wa says, نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ We provide you and them. We provide you and who? Them. In another place he says, نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ We provide them and you. One place he says, we provide you and them. Other place he says what? We provide them and you. To us it's the same thing. To us the sequence, I mean we would, normal people when they speak, they wouldn't be so sensitive to you came first, them came later, it's the same thing. But in the Qur'an, this is hypersensitive. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ 
Don't kill your children because of poverty. Don't kill your children. What? Because of poverty. When he says because of poverty, poverty already exists. When poverty already exists, who are you worried about feeding? Yourself. So Allah says we provide you and them. Then he says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشْيَةَ إِمْلَاقِ Don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. Not because of poverty, but fear of poverty. Fear is something in the future. Like the children who are coming in the future. So he says, we provide them and you. SubhanAllah. It is so perfect, the word. When you study it, when you study the... And this is just one area of the Qur'an's perfection. The placement of words. The sequence of words. This is just one area. Another area I'd like to share with you. Perfection of the choice of words. Choice of words. You know who the messenger Shu'aib is? Shu'aib? Which nation was he sent to? He was sent to Madian. وَإِلَى مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا To Madian, we sent their brother, what? The brother who? Shu'aib. Remember the phrase is, وَإِلَى مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا To Madian, we sent their brother, Shu'aib. Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Ash-Shu'ara, He speaks about lots of prophets. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ نُوحِ when their brother Nuh said to them, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ هُود How should I translate? When their brother Hud said to them, وَإِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ صَالِحِ How should I translate that? When their brother Salih said to them, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ شُعَيْب When Shu'aib said to them, for everyone else he said, their brother Nuh said, their brother Salih said, their brother Hud said, their brother Lut said, but when he came to Shu'aib, what did he say? Shu'aib said. He didn't say what? Their brother Shu'aib said. He didn't say that. He skipped out on their brother. Now in another place in the Quran, he says, like I told you, وَإِلَى مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا To Madian we sent their brother Shu'aib. In this surah where everybody gets the label brother, 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 the only one who doesn't get the label is who? Shu'aib alayhi salam. Why? Why would Allah Azza wa Jal take that word away? What nation was he sent to? Madian. Madian has another name in the Quran, you know? Ashabul Aika. Another name is Ashabul Aika. Now, Madian is a race of people and it's also a place. It's a race of people. And it's also a place. Now, Aika was a giant tree that they used to worship. So when Allah calls them the people of Aika, is that their racial name or their religious name? That's their religious name. In the surah where I told you, إِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا To Madian, we sent their brother Shu'aib. When it comes to his race, is he their brother? When it comes to his race... It's the same race, same people, same region. He's their brother. But in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَذَّبَتْ أَصْحَابُ الْأَيْكَةِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ The people of Aika lied against the messengers when Shu'aib said to them, he says Shu'aib, not their brother Shu'aib, because Allah used the name Ashabu Al-Aika, the name of their religion. When it comes to their religion, is he their brother? So he says Shu'aib said. He doesn't say their brother Shu'aib said. There is this degree of sensitivity in the Qur'an in, in, in its literary form that you don't find anywhere else. It's impossible. And it's consistent over and over and over again. Look at this ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَنْ تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ Allah Azza wa Jal speaks of all heavenly bodies. Each of them in their own assigned space, they are floating, swimming, rotating. What's he speaking about? Bodies in space, planets, stars, right? Galaxies. He's speaking about all of them doing what? Rotating. Spell out the first words, كُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ What's the first letter in Kullun Fi Falak? 
Keep going. When you and I speak, then what? Then what? Then what? What's the last letter? What's the first letter? What's the second, last, and second? What's the third, last, and third? You notice something? What are they rotating around? What, what, what letter are they rotating around? The word he used for rotating, yasbahoon, yeah. SubhanAllah. How do you do that? How do, how do human beings come up with that? Allah Azza wa Jal speaks, and this is not written form. This is not written word. This is spoken word. Allah Azza wa Jal gave this Qur'an to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he would recite it unto the people. So he would recite it as a word. We are baffled even the way it's spelled. Even the way it's written. But it was baffling, mind-boggling, stunning, really stunning. <coughs> in its perfected form. A few very quick cases inshallah and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. You know the difference between past tense and present tense? The Qur'an uses past tense and also uses of course present tense and future tense. When I say killed, killed, is that past tense, present or future? Past. When I say kills, that's present tense. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً Whoever killed a believer by mistake. Whoever killed a believer by mistake. Is that past tense or present tense? Remember that, okay? Which one is, by, uh, which is past tense, by mistake or on purpose? When you kill a believer by mistake. Then he says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا Whoever kills... A believer on purpose. Whoever killed a believer by mistake and whoever kills a believer on purpose. So when it came to killing on purpose, which was used? Past tense or present tense? Present tense. Same passage. You would think you'd stick to the same tense. But no. When it came to killing by mistake, he uses past tense. When it came, came to killing on purpose, he used which one? Present tense. You know why? The past tense only happened once. I went to the Texas Dawah Convention. What does that mean? One time. I go to the Texas Dawah Convention. What does that mean? I go every year. Right? So now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of a person who killed by mistake. How many times do you kill someone by mistake? You only commit murder by mistake once. The second time you say, oh, mistake, then... <laughs> So the one who kills on purpose is a perpetrator and he should be punished because chances are what? He'll do it again, hence the present tense, because it has continuity. The past tense murderer, because it's mistaken. The present tense, because it's on purpose. There's continuity. SubhanAllah. Even in the tense, even in the choice of words, the tense of words, there is such hypersensitivity that does not exist in any other literary form. These are the things that are lost. These are the things that are lost when you stop becoming students of what language? Don't say Arabic, that'll disappoint me. Quranic Arabic with ancient Arabic. Ancient Arabic and its perfected form is Quranic Arabic. Ancient Arabic never reached where Quranic Arabic reached even. So the pinnacle of it is Quranic Arabic. This is why the standard of Arabic is the Quran. The standard of Arabic, to judge whether something is good Arabic or bad Arabic, the standard of it is the Qur'an. This is even as, uh, understood and appreciated by non-Muslims, non-Muslim Arabic uh, literaries. SubhanAllah. Last two, inshaAllah, examples, and then I'll take your questions if you have any. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and this is about the, the uh, unique placement of words. وَكَذَٰلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً Anyone know? وَسَطًا وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا This is how we made you, and that is how we formed you, a middle nation, a balanced nation. وَسَط literally is right in between. فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعًا Surah Al-Adiyat They get right into the middle of the gathering, the horses, they penetrate. So Allah made us a middle nation, a middle nation, a balanced nation. 
This is ayah number 143 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Ayah number what again? 143. Of a total of how many ayahat of Surah Al-Baqarah? It is the middle ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. 143, half of 286. And the middle ayah says, we made you a middle nation. SubhanAllah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Last one. Last one. There, there are many, many, many angles that I, we could talk about this, this subject from, but we'll hold off on that until the seminar in April, inshallah, if you're coming. Uh, we'll talk about these areas of the Qur'an in depth. At the end, I'll share with you just some areas that we're going to try and explore. But as a last one, this is very subtle, very small. Two, I, two come to my head, so I'll share two with you. Allah Azza wa Jal, I think this is the fourth, or the, something like the fourth ayah of Surah Al-Ahzab. How much time do I have, by the way? 15 minutes, sweet. Okay. Question two? Okay, great. I'll take this at the end, inshallah. All right. So, in Surah Al Ahzab, Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about uh, spousal issues, marital issues. The ayah begins with men and moves on to discussing women. The ayah begins with men and moves on to what? Women. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah did not put two hearts inside of any man. He says, Allah did not put two hearts inside of any man. لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ The rest of the ayah speaks about the azwaj, the spouses. Now the thing is, Allah Azza wa did not say, Allah did not put two hearts inside of any human being. He excluded who? Yeah, he just said he didn't put two hearts inside of any man. And this is perfection in its literal form, not literary, but literal form, because women can get pregnant. And when they get pregnant, how many hearts are inside? Could be two or more. So Allah says he didn't put two hearts inside of any man. SubhanAllah Even in its literary form Literal form Literally You can't play the devil's advocate and say Yeah, what about women? You said insan Women have two hearts No, you can't Because you said man Yirajulin There's this thing in Arabic called idgham You may have heard of it in tajweed It's also in sarf In sarf It's, a, it's a, the science of morphology of Arabic What it does is it lets you fuse words together And I'll show you one thing in the, in the Quran Okay, read the first word out loud for me. Yatadabbaru. Yatadabbaru. What's the second word? Yadabbaru. They're actually the same word. The Arab says, Yatadabbaru, too much work. So let's just take the ta and the dal and fuse them together, put a shadda on top, make life easier. So he says, Yadabbaru. They're the same word. This is called idgham, fusion. Fusing two letters together for convenience. In modern Arabic, they're the same. In classical Arabic, they're a little bit different. Which is the abbreviated form? What do you think? The second one, yadabbaru is abbreviated. Yatadabbaru, yatadabbaru is the complete form. Now, tadabbur in Arabic means to reflect, to ponder, to ponder. Which is a more complete form of the word again? Yatadabbaru. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He speaks about the entire Qur'an, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Did He use the complete form? Yeah. When He speaks of any part of the Qur'an, not the whole thing. Just some ayat, some word. Guess what? He uses the partial form. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ He uses the partial form of the word when he speaks about a part of the Qur'an and he uses the complete form of the word when he uses what? He speaks of the complete Qur'an يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Even in the way words are spelled, there's a miracle Even in the way they're spelled, there's perfection There's precision There's minute detail There's minute, minute detail so this is, we're, we're kind of, what I've shared with you thus far is on the micro level. Meaning we're zooming in on the ayah, zooming in on a word. 
we're looking at a word with great, great detail and trying to explore the sophistication of the Qur'an from that point of view. Then what? But there are other issues. For instance, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, He take, gives many examples in the Qur'an. He gives many, many examples. You want to do an example before we go? There's just one? One of my favorites? Okay, we'll do one of my favorites. Uh, some of you may have heard this before, but that's okay. It's good to remember. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks in Surah Al-Hajj. Surah Al-Hajj is Surah number 22. This, I believe, is Ayah number 31. bihi. They are solely dedicated to Allah while not committing any shirk with Him whatsoever. وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ And whoever was to commit shirk with Allah, or is to commit shirk with Allah, فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ Then it is as though he fell from the sky. I want you to remember this example. Whoever does shirk with Allah is like someone who fell from the sky. فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ This is the first part of the example Allah gives. The comparison between the mushrik and the guy falling from the sky. Then he says, فَتَخْتَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ Then birds are snatching off of him. Birds are having lunch on this guy. Birds are eating him. Or wind is blowing him away to a far off uncharted place. Three parts of the example. First part, he's falling from where? The sky. Second part, what's happening? Birds are eating him. Third part. Huh? Wind blows him away to a far off place. Nodeki, a, a famous orientalist, one of the first pioneer orientalists who critiqued the Quran, he wrote that, a, that an example, the point of an example is to make sense to the audience. After all, why does a teacher give an example? To make the subject easy, right? The subject is hard, let me give you an example. Now if my example is harder than the subject, then it kind of beats the point, right? So you have to, you have to give exa examples to the audience, to the listener, to the student, <coughs> that makes the subject easy, that makes the subject more approachable, it's something you can relate to, Nodeki argues, look, falling from the sky, nobody's ever seen it. I can't relate to it. Neither could the Arabs. Even if not the day of airplanes, who could ever have imagined falling from the sky? Example doesn't make sense. Then he says birds are eating from him. He argues 9.8 something meters per second square. What kind of birds are these? That this guy is falling with acceleration due to gravity and these birds are still eating him. And what size of birds are these? They're eating a live man as he's falling from the sky. Beyond imagination. Can't see this happening. Then he says, well, you're falling from the sky. If you fall off to an uncharted place, or you fall in a famous place, aren't you equally dead? So what's the point of fall falling in an uncharted place? So he critiques the example. He says the example doesn't make sense. The only problem, once again, his criticism is based on proper Arabic without an understanding of what? Ancient Arabic. One of the things I didn't tell you about ancient Arabic is that it has its own expressions, idioms. An idiom in English is, that's cool. If you said, that's cool a hundred years ago. I said, what are you talking about? It's Florida. It's not cool. So you, you wouldn't think of that's cool the same way. The words are the same, but the meanings change. Isn't that true? Right? The words are exactly the same. We're living in crazy times. Kids go to a basketball game, they come out and they say, that's cool. And the other kid says, that was hot. And they mean the same thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> expressions change. Expressions change. The Qur'an uses expressions of the ancient Arabs. Did those expressions change over time? Yes. You have to understand, if you take the expression and you understand it literally, you've lost the meaning. It's not literal, it's an expression. You have to understand the expression behind it. Like when somebody says to you, no use crying over spilt milk. You say, I didn't spill milk, I lost my job, man. That, you've missed the point, right? There's an expression. So, <laughs> but anyhow, let's quickly go to this example so we finish on time. I have how much time? Okay, so I'll take my time. All right, 15 minutes. I'll take less, inshallah. All right, so here's the thing. Allah Azza wa Jal speaks of the one falling from the sky. By the way, who was this person being compared to? The guy falling from the sky, what's he? Mushrik. Most of the Arabs at the time. Most of these Arabs didn't believe in an afterlife. Most Arabs believe that the only thing you have to look forward to is what? Death. There's nothing after that. It's game over. That's it. So if you, the only thing ahead of you is what? Death. And you're being reminded about hellfire and resurrection and the sun and the moon colliding. You say, ah, I don't know. No, man. In hiya illa hayatuna dunya. This is just worldly life of ours. Namutu wa nahi. We live, we die. That's it. There's nothing more. I don't understand this whole akhirah stuff. Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to this adamant, this disbelieving mind. 
trying to relate to this audience. The only thing they have to look forward to if there's no hereafter is what again? Death. <coughs> if you know anything about the Arabs, they were a warrior people. They were really big on their, their tribal warfare pride. Right? Nowadays we have sports teams. Right? We take pride in a sports team and we, people paint their faces and all that kind of stuff. Their pride was their tribe and their battles. The worst kind of death legacy you can leave behind is the death of a coward. The death of a loser. Because after all, once you're, you're dead and there's no hereafter, what's the only thing left of you? Your legacy, your reputation, that's all that's left. So now, to the Arabs, they use this expression falling from the sky even before the Qur'an was revealed. They used to say falling from the sky all the time. But you know what they meant by it? They meant that there are two tribes fighting. One tribe is on top of the cliff, the other tribe is on the bottom of the cliff. Which one has the advantage? The guy's on top. Despite being on top of the cliff, if they still lost in battle, and the enemy did what with their bodies? Chuck them off the cliff. They used to call this what? Falling from the sky. There are two scenarios. Either they lost, which means they were lousy fighters, despite having the advantage, or they were running away, retreating from the enemy, and in their retreat they trip, and what happens? They fall, so they died the death of a coward. Either they died the death of a loser or a coward. These are the worst legacies that the Arabs would ever want to leave behind. The ugliest kind of end they could imagine would be captured in the words, falling from the sky. Allah speaks to these mushrik, these mushrik Arabs, who don't have any concept of the hereafter, who have no concept of the humiliation of the Day of Judgment, so He gives them a word that will help them understand from their worldview, what's the ugliest thing you can imagine? Let me tell you, shirk is like that. Shirk is like falling from the sky. When you die in battle, you know, this is ancient human tradition. When people die in battle, two sides collide, they, this, corpses are lying all over the place. Once the battle is done, what happens to those corpses? Each side comes with their people and takes their dead and gives them a proper burial. Isn't that what happens? Unless you feel that your soldier was a traitor or a humiliation or an embarrassment to your tribe, then nobody comes for you. And when nobody comes for you, guess what comes for you? Birds, at tayr which in jahili shi'r, in classical poetry, is used more than often for vultures. Birds of carrion, eating dead meat. So now birds are gnawing away at this, this humiliated corpse, who is disassociated from its own tribe people, they don't even want to have anything to do with him. <coughs> These disgusting birds eat their lunch, and even they don't want any more. Even they don't want any more. Now what comes? Now a wind comes and bro blows off whatever scum of you is left into uncharted territory. You're just trash on the earth. Decomposed trash on the earth. The ugliest, ugliest ending that the Arab could imagine has been displayed in such beautiful terms. With one example, just so he could get an idea what you're dealing with, what you think shirk is a small thing, put things in your perspective. You see how powerful the Qur'an is in its examples? The thing of it is, and this is something that may be a point of confusion for some of you. In our times, people say things like, well the Qur'an says that it's clear. I should be able to understand it myself. All these mufassirs, they're just trying to give me their opinion. I'm going to figure it out for myself. Which is your way of saying, I want to be a mufassir for myself. But actually, to be honest, the Qur'an, does it say that it's clear? It does. Does it say that it's self-evident? Yes, but the Qur'an never says that it's simple. We shouldn't confuse clear and self-evident with what? Simple. Two different things. Two different things. The Qur'an presents us sometimes very clear solutions to very complex problems. I often give the example of a calculus problem. Imagine there's a really hard calculus problem and your professor writes a really clear solution to the problem. Now the solution may be clear, but is it simple? No. Don't oversimplify the Qur'an. Because in fact, it has a great deal of complexity. Its complexity contains its clarity. Don't confuse simplicity with clarity. They're two different things. In many places the Qur'an is simple, yes. But in many, many more places the Qur'an is complex. Now, does the Qur'an have universal guidance, universal benefit across generations? It's timeless. 
The other argument you get is if the Qur'an is timeless, why do we have to study history to understand the Qur'an? The Qur'an's message, the Qur'an's lessons, the Qur'an's wisdom, the Sunnah's wisdom too, they're all timeless. They're all timeless. But the Qur'an's language, the Qur'an's mode of communication is not timeless. It was revealed in a very particular time with very particular language. So if you want to get the timeless lessons out of the Qur'an, you have to study what? Ancient Arabic, you have to go back in time. You have to go study that particular language in which the Qur'an was revealed. Not doing justice to that language waters down, sometimes even de uh, uh, you know, uh, deforms the message of the book. It sometimes even deforms the message of the book. The, th the aspects of the Qur'an that I didn't share with you today were from the grammatical point of view. I didn't talk to you about the oaths in the Qur'an. I didn't talk to you about the structure of the surah. How Allah Azza wa Jal organizes the surah, how the surahs are laid out next to each other to form complete literary you know, units and structures. We didn't talk about these things. I just talked about here and there sporadically a few examples of the literary beauty and marvel of the Qur'an.